Welcome to From the Quarries. The Kirkwall Scroll is a Masonic curiosity which can be found at Lodge Kirkwall Kilwinning number 382 in Orkney. Its origin, provenance and symbolism are unclear. Maybe it involves the Knights Templar. Just maybe it rewrites the history of Scotland. Stay tuned to the end of the video to hear the latest on this fascinating artefact. Good evening and welcome to tonight's presentation From the Quarries, an archive of Masonic lore. The Lodge Kirkwall Kilwinning, number 382, was founded on the first day of October 1736 by John Berryhill, Freemason from the ancient Lodge of Stirling, and Worshipful Master Meldrum from the Lodge of Dumfernland. These two brethren, having admitted other four, the six formed themselves into a proper court, of which Mr Alexander Bakey, merchant in Kirkwall, was the first master. The Lodge obtained a regular charter from the Grand Lodge of Scotland on the 1st of December 1740, which is signed by William Sinclair of Roslyn, Grand Master. The original charter is still carefully preserved in the Lodge, along with the curious scroll presently to be referred to, and most of the old minutes and of meetings and accounts of the treasurers. For many years, the meetings were held in an upper room of the old town hall and latterly in the old town hall itself. On the 26th of August, 1887, the present hall was duly opened and consecrated. In 1759, the minutes of the lodge refer to a scroll, 18 feet 6 inches in length and 5 feet 6 inches in width. The material of which it is composed is a strong linen, and consists of a full width of cloth in the centre, with a divided width sewn along each side. It occupies the west wall of the lodge room, but the height of the apartment is not sufficient to show the whole scroll at one time. It is very roughly painted in oil, the emblems down the centre being mainly in pale blue, but the top panel shows some attempt to imitate nature, the hills being brown, the sea green, the trees brown, the ground reddish. Eve and the animals and the fishes are pink. On each side of the centre strip runs a ribbon of three colours, blue, yellow and green, the blue being inside. On the left side the rivers and cities are green, the trees and hills brown and the same may be said of the other side, the tents and symbols however being blue. The margin all round is a dark slate colour. The border on the spectator's left hand would seem to represent a map of the wanderings of the Hebrews until their settlement in Egypt. The rivers Tigris and Euphrates run down the centre, through a pastoral country almost devoid of cities, but in the lowermost panel we are landed in Egypt, with the Nilus running through it and many cities and buildings depicted. The right-hand border should apparently be read from the bottom to the top and seems to portray the wanderings of the Israelites in the desert. The central ribbon is not a river but evidently a road and is marked off in years, beginning at year 1 and ending at year 46. We start from the land of Midian and Mount Sinai and have the first camp, the fall of manna, a graveyard, the waters of the rock, the worship of the golden calf, sepulchre of Sarah, of Aaron, the elevation of the serpent, etc. While at the 46th year, the road branches into numerous smaller paths, one leading to a building, which probably is intended for the temple at Jerusalem. Both margins, especially the right-hand one, are covered with city and place names, but rather, brother R. Muir, 
writes that The names appear to be of a more modern date than the scroll itself, and have not all been written at the same time even. The ink is different and fresher in certain instances, and some of the writing is plainly by a different hand. The central panels speak for themselves. They commence at the top with Eve and the animals in the Garden of Eden. But why Adam is omitted, it will be difficult to say. And end at the bottom with the craft degrees. There are several cryptograms, some of which I have deciphered, but others have eluded my skill. At the very top is one such word, and another will be found at the base of the hourglass-like figure in the second panel. On the cornice of the altar within the arch is a third. The next panel shows a cryptogram on the face of the altar, which I have partially sold. The chief difficulty consisting in the fact that many of the characters are incorrectly depicted. But, making the needful alterations, it reads, I am hath sent me unto you. I am that I am. I am the rose of Sharon, and the lily of the valley. Haji in her hijah. I am that I am, or I will be that I will be. Jalda Jaldadaya. I have italicized four of the words in the body of the inscription because I can make no sense of them, or even suggest any corrections in the writing which would make sense. I have merely transliterated them as they stand. The last word of all is in exactly the same case, but I am inclined to think that it was intended for hallelujah. To the left of this is something which might be a Highlander's feather bonnet, or a fountain, or even a tree, with a scroll beneath. On the ribbon is a word thrice repeated, which if written in the same cipher would read, Jugi, Jugi, Jugi. If not the same cipher, then it is almost impossible to guess what it means, as there is not enough of it to furnish a clue. The words three, three, three would obviously be possible, and I may, it may be an allusion to the three times three so well known in masonry. The altar in the lowest panel also has a cryptogram on its cornice and face, which, being transliterated, without making any allowance for incorrect writing, reads 1 Chronicles 2 Cap Chapter 48 49 Judges Chapter 12 6 7 Hensus Chapter 1 4 22 1 Kings Chapter 7 21 Mashu Chapter 16 18 this represents the kind of faults to be found in the verses given above. They arise from the want of a dot, or the redundance of one, or from a line more or less different in the characters. It may be worthy of consideration whether the original purpose of the scroll was not to serve as a floor cloth for the lodge for which its size would be unsuitable. The earliest form of our modern movable tracing board was that of a floor cloth, consisting of various symbolical designs of which the mosaic pavement was usually, although not always, a feature. The actual tracing board, sometimes called a square, was blank. Gradually, the design was transferred to the board and the floor cloth preserved only the pavement. If this supposition be correct, the date of the scroll would fall into the first half of the 18th century, or very little later. Failing some clue, which we can scarcely hope to find except at Kirkwall itself, its origin is likely to remain a mystery. The scroll can scarcely have been intended to hang on the wall as it does now, unless, indeed, a lodge chamber 20 feet high was contemplated. Modern interpretations written in the century since that last item was published in AQC have gone into some detail about what the symbolism of the scroll could mean. According to various sources, the symbolism is thus. In the left border, reading from top to bottom, 
there appears to show the biblical passage of the Israelites before they arrived in Egypt. The right shows their wanderings in the wilderness after the Exodus, with the route marked in the years from 1 to 46. The central cloth is clearly divided into seven painted scenes. From top to bottom, it appears to depict 1. A naked woman, presumed to be Eve, sits under a tree surrounded by animals. In the distance, we can make out a scene of the ocean or lake filled with fish of varying shapes and sizes, beyond which are the mountains. Above this is the canopy of heaven, with sun, moon and stars, and a cloud bearing Hebrew letters. 2. What appears to be a step pyramid, above which is a mounted cross, topped by a rainbow and surrounded by Masonic and possibly alchemical symbols. 3. An illustration of what could be the Last Judgment. 4. A layout of the Tabernacle of the Ark of the Covenant. 5. An altar with pillars to each side and cherubim, very similar to those on the arms of the ancient Grand Lodge of England, the Grand Lodge of Ireland and the United Grand Lodge of England. 6. An altar surrounded by symbols. 7. The bottom section depicts an altar flanked by two pillars and familiar Masonic symbols. Needless to say, there has been much interpretation and over-interpretation of the scroll. All of this is intriguing enough. The scroll obviously has some reference to the ancient accepted Scottish rite, as well as the difficulty in interpreting correctly both the Hebrew and cryptographic features of the writing. But in the words of the immortal Demtel ads, wait, there's more. I came across the following article from late 2019, which gives an update to the story of the scroll. The following is an extract from an article written by Kath Gourlay, The Priceless Scroll, Carbon Dated. The results of radiocarbon dating carried out on a rare wall hanging has shocked members of a Masonic lodge in the Orkney Islands, who have been told that their document is a medieval treasure and worth several million pounds. Writer Andrew Sinclair claims that the little-known Kirkwall scroll is second in value only to the famous 13th century Mappa Mundi, which hangs in Hereford Cathedral. It's beyond price, says Sinclair who heard about the scroll while researching the history of the St. Clair Earls of Orkney. Its significance is immense. This will demand the rewriting of Scott's medieval history. He claims that radiocarbon dating of the scroll points to the huge 18-foot sailcloth hanging as being 15th century. The operative side of the craft, connected with the trade guilds and stonemasons, was also strongly associated with St. Clair's, says Roslyn Chapel's exhibition director, Bob Bryden. So there's little doubt that the Kirkwall scroll has very significant implications. However, Bryden is not convinced that the scroll is 15th century. It is usual to date these kind of things stylistically, he says, and the small copy we have hanging in the Roslyn Museum is a perfect example of 18th century naive art. Unique, perhaps, because of the symbolism, and in Masonic terms, it is indeed priceless. It's quite feasible it's a copy of an earlier document, he adds, and when things are copied, the style of the era, era is usually very noticeable. Contact with the University of Oxford Research Laboratory, which did the radiocarbon dating, adds to the mystery by supporting both dates. We analysed the material from the Kirkwall scroll on two separate occasions, says a spokesman from the Archaeology and History of Art Department, which carried out the work. You have to allow a certain margin of error in calibrating carbon content, and the first sample, taken from the outside edge of the material, was possibly 18th or early 19th century. The second piece, which came from the central panel, produced a much older date, 15th or early 16th century. 
a senior lodge member from Kirkwall, says they have a possible answer to that one. The cloth has been joined at some stage. You can clearly see where the two side panels interlink with the centre panel. Andrew Sinclair, however, says the scroll is unique in that it proves how the ancient knowledge amassed by the Templar Knights during the Crusades has been passed on into Freemasonry for safekeeping by the Sinclairs. However, many other historians disagree from this view, saying that there is no conclusive evidence to support it. But Sinclair is adamant. The statement by Sinclair that the priceless scroll should be removed for safekeeping has incensed them. Anything is priceless if you've got a market for it, so his sensation-making claims of it being worth millions mean nothing. It is priceless to us, and we have safeguarded it for well more than two and a half centuries. No one can have access without special permission, and it is protected from the light, so we would urge, leave well alone. Clearly the story of the scroll is not yet over, and contention reigns supreme. Is it 15th century? Does it prove a connection between the Templars and Freemasonry? Or is it just an old piece of cloth that was used to make a floor cloth sometime in the 1700s? What do you think? For more Masonic podcasts, videos, music, texts and artwork, visit fromthequarries.com or subscribe to our YouTube, Twitter and Facebook accounts by searching From the Quarries. Thank you.